joining us tonight. I'll take a couple minutes just to let everybody join and then I'll properly introduce myself and all the others. Thank you for being with us. I speak now just to fill the air so you're not entering a quiet room and so you can make sure that your sound's working well enough. Um, I hope you're all doing well and all staying safe. Um, and have uh, any of you gotten to vote already? Let me, let me ask that. New Yorkers are voting. I know that. Um, it's wonderful to see so many hands up. I hope uh, everybody else will be voting by, uh, by Tuesday, I guess. Um, good. I'm seeing some good friends out there. Folks, turn on your cameras. We love seeing you. We miss everybody. Um, please uh, share your living room art with us and, um, and be a part of this. This is a, we're a community center and this is a, um, a communal event. We're just gonna give another minute or so to allow people to join and then we're gonna get started. Um, the conversation will be about um, half an hour long. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, I hope you've all seen the film. If you haven't seen the film yet, um, Morgan, so when can they see the film? Uh, midnight tonight. So midnight tonight, so you can still catch up if you're doing this backwards and seeing the film after the conversation. We'll see how the conversation is and then we'll go and watch the film. If the conversation's really good, then, then we're into it. If it's not, then we'll skip the film. Um, oh. And of course you, um, you can join us um, for other films coming up. And um, we just, I, I will start sharing, actually, we'll wait a minute till I officially share. So I wanna let everybody be here and be a part of the conversation. Um, I will start by saying that of course it's, I, I had to look it up. I didn't remember how many years ago we um, actually premiered Rosenwald at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan and um, we're really, I, I got to revisit this film um, five years later and I'm really excited that we get to present it again at this time. I think it, it, it plays, it played for me completely differently and we'll get into that a little bit more. I think um, we are ready to officially start. So welcome everyone. My name is Isaac Sablocki. I am the um, director of film programs at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special conversation um, for the film Rosenwald, which I hope most of you have seen. If not, as mentioned, you could see it um, till um, tonight at midnight. You could tell your friends to see it till tonight at midnight and then it disappears forever. Now, just kidding. I'm sure Aviva Kempner, the director who's here with us, will be able to share with you exactly where you could see that um, as well as all of her other amazing films, um, which, um, um, I'd love to hear how we, we should get those on our streaming side of Viva. We should get some of your classics up there. Um, of course, a little um, bit more Karen, you. you Who Misses Goldberg, and um, many more fabulous films, many of which we've screened at the JCC. And Aviva's here with us tonight. Aviva, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we also have the granddaughter of JR, if I could call him that, it sounds like everybody is, um, Elizabeth Barrett. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being back with us. Um, we realized that this was our duo for the original conversation five years ago. And um, I remember it being wonderful and look forward to um, following up on it. Before we jump into things, just to tell you a little bit about what's coming up next. Um, this, uh, I started talking about the election and this Monday we have our pre-election day um, conversation. It's, uh, we're bringing in a panel of filmmakers, um, films relating to our democracy, and I think very close to some of the themes of this election. So it's our Films for Democracy panel, which will be at noon on uh, Monday. And uh, we have three films, uh, three filmmakers from three different films that will be joining us. Um, so check out those films. You can watch them through our site now and we'll, we, we link you to all those films. There's a film Represent, um, The Antidote, and all in the fight for democracy. So it's gonna be a fascinating conversation and that's coming up um, really this week. It's, 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 it's already here, thank God. Um, then the following week, we're having the premiere of a new HBO Max um, TV show, an Israeli TV show um, called Valley of Tears. It's gonna make a lot of noise. So Whoa. we're gonna have this special preview with the creators of the show um, on November 10th, join us for that. Um, 
Um, followed by the following week, Saul and Ruby's Holocaust Survivor Band is going to be on um, November 17th. And then we have um, Love on the Spectrum, um, the TV show, the Netflix show, um, is going to be joining us at the end of November, November 24th. Um, we're going to have people from the cast and crew for a conversation around that. Um, then following that, the last pitch I'm going to give is our Other Israel Film Festival went live today. Um, it's a film festival that focuses on minority populations in Israel and a lot of the interesting political drama that goes on. Um, so check out otherisrael.org and be the first to get your passes. That's what's available at this point. Um, more on this will follow, of course. Now jumping into our conversation, I introduced our guests already tonight um, and I I want to start, I guess, from the, from the beginning. And Aviva, maybe you could share. Um, after making films about um, uh, baseball heroes and TV heroes, what brought you to um, Rosenwald? Uh, well, yes, my MO is to make films about underknown Jewish heroes, and it, mostly in the last century. And it turns out, mid last century, it turns out I was at the vineyard. And I was going to a lecture at the Hebrew Center, Martha's Vineyard, that is. And it was um, a showcasing Rabbi David Saperstein, who's a friend, a great reform rabbi, who was the head of the rack at one point, and Julian Bond, who was very active in the civil rights hero and a real hero of mine. And it was billed as Blacks and Jews. So I'm sitting down and I'm thinking that Julian would talk about you know, what happened during the civil rights era. And then he started talking about Julius Rosenwald, who I had once heard about before. And it was like a light bulb went off in my head. And I said, that has to be uh, my next film. This was about 15 years ago. And it was great because I was able to meet and become friends with uh, his grandchildren, many of which continue in his name. And what for me, what was really important is that I grew up in Detroit. My father had been involved in the poverty program. I had been on the little too young to be in the civil rights movement, but it was something very important to me because I went to an all city school, uh, very integrated. And it was, it was a topic I really wanted to address. And it's interesting to me because, you know, my father and my mother and my stepfather always brought me up with the principle of Tukum alone repairing the world. And here was to me the most incredible story. And I was just thrilled to be able to do it. And I should have started off the discussion with thanking Isaac. I've showcased my films, uh, two of my films there. And whenever I stay in New York, I stay about three blocks away. So I feel like it's my JCC in New York because I happen to establish the one here in Washington. And I also want to thank the Kellogg Foundation for giving me a grant so I can have these free screenings all around the country. Um, and I think in this time with the whole issue of Black Lives Matter, it's even more important to have this film where, you know, especially for Blacks and Jews, <coughs> see our common history. And I realized how prophetic I was putting Black Lives Matter as one of the dedications in 215. As a matter of fact, I got a little flack, I'm not gonna mention to who, from a Jewish leader in Chicago. And I said, no, this is what's really important to me. And now, you know, it's it's really the standard and something that we have to be very careful to, you know, to follow. I'm also thrilled that John Lewis was in the film. And, you know, when he, his famous expression was, you know, if you see something, do something. And, you know, when you think about it, that's exactly what JR was when he realized there needed to be black education, when he needed, to be a housing, you know, a good apartment building built, uh, a science museum, and to support all those artisans. I mean, it's just incredible to me, the, well, the sort of the breadth of his work. And I just want to tell you some factoids. You have Barbara Bowman in the film talking about the Michigan Garden Apartments. Well, she just happens to be Valerie Jarrett's mother, who was, you know, the domestic, uh, head of domestic policy with President Obama. And her grandfather was the one who designed um, the, the, the schools. Also, they have re, if you go to Chicago, you can see the most beautiful reconstruction of those Michigan Garden apartments because for years they just uh, fell in disuse and now they've been totally restored. And 
Uh, there's a DVD not only of um, the Rosenwald film, but also has four and a half hours of bonus features, including that uh, re uh, re restoration. The other thing that, I, uh, that gives me great pleasure is it was obviously Booker T. Washington's idea to start building the schools, but it was really the generosity and the concept of you know matching funds of Julius Rosenwald. But Julius, because you know he did such a magnificent job with Sears, thought, well, why don't we just use the kid houses? The one thing that at least we document in the film that Booker T stood up to him and said, no, we want to design them ourselves. And that's such an important concept because it really means not only the community raised money, but the people living in it helped build it. And I think that was another great um, aspect. Uh, I'm the daughter of an artist and the fact that the Rosenwald Fund invested in so many young African-American artists uh, of such note and I don't know if you all read this past week how they just found, you know, Jacob Lawrence, who did the Great Migration series under a Rosenwald grant. They just found it was a set, taught, um, written about in the New York Times, uh, a painting of his who had just been in someone's house. But for me, the big cause is Augusta Savage. You can just see in the film how she was not able to pay to bring back the heart back. And actually, I have a miniature of it I'm going to show right now. So I have written an essay that you can get online in the New York Times. And then Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation had a study done. And, you know, we talk a lot about destroying or removing statues. What I really want to do is see that Augusta Savage, the harp, is restored not only in Queens or in New York where it originally was, but also I would love it. I live in Washington to have, be at an African American Museum, maybe in Chicago. I keep on thinking, you know, Obama's museum and then her birthplace in Florida. So that's the kind of legacy in the film and what JR do, did that I, I'm trying to continue and work on. Um, thank you so much. And actually, this gives me a quick opportunity to thank some of our partners for tonight. And you mentioned um, a big, uh, the Kellogg Foundation, and a big thanks to the Kellogg Foundation, um, to the National Center for Jewish Film, who um, helped uh, us uh, present this film um, to you, to um, JCC Harlan, who um, partnered on this and helped get the word out to the community up there, um, as well as our Center for Social Responsibility, who are active partners on this and active partners on our Cinematters Film Festival that uh, will be coming up on MLK Weekend Month of Founders. That um, was one thing. I, yeah. I'm curious where, where your Harlem location is because you know that's where Augusta taught and many of the artists that got grants were there. So it might be nice to just do a map thing, you know, to figure out if you know it's nearby. And the only thing I, I didn't mention is the, you know, we had these 5,000 magnificent schools, but through the years, once there was integration, they, a lot of them went in disrepair. And thanks to the National Trust for Historical Preservation, over a hundred of them have been restored. And if you're making, once we can travel again, I know both, um, uh, we were, you know, I've been able to go and Elizabeth's been able to go. It is so rewarding to see these restored schools that are mostly museums and community centers. So we're honored to have here, um, I keep calling him JR, but um, oh, <laughs> Mr. Rosenwald's, um, uh, Julius Rosenwald's granddaughter, um, Elizabeth, who you've seen in the film. And um, maybe you could tell me a little bit, actually, I want to I wanted to reflect for a moment, um, uh, Aviva mentioned Black Lives Matter. And I wanted to reflect for a moment on, on your thoughts, thoughts of where he would be with this movement right now. Um, it's really interesting to me that, you know, this is uh, seeing this film is all free civil rights, pre, pre the civil rights movement, all the Rosenwald school, schools actually are kind of like by the definition of the civil rights movement, um, um, you know, are, are not something that would exist anymore. Um, what was his kind of take on, on, um, on the community and, um, and on, of course, um, reaching real equality? Um, first of all, I want to say hello and everybody, and I hope you're all doing well during this time. I don't know about you, but everything's taken me a little longer and my mind is a little fuzzier. 
Uh, not that my children can tell the difference. They all think I was fuzzy minded anyway, but um, I'm very glad that you all came and I hope you see the film because Aviva has done an amazing job uh, 13 years and she pestered so many people and she worked so hard and she got so much information stuff I never knew. Let me make it clear. I never met my grandfather. He died 11 years before I was born, unless it was in a different life that I don't remember. And so, um, but I, I do know a lot about him. And my father told many, many stories. Uh, by the way, my father was called WR, so <laughs> carry on, but don't you call me ER. So anyway, um, uh, I, I'm very um, hesitant to say what anybody would think about anything because I sometimes don't even know what I'm thinking about things. But uh, I think that he, he wasn't a philosopher. He was a doer and uh, he was a manager and he was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I, how many, just give me, a, I know I can only see one page because the rest of you are sort of hiding behind screens stuff, but how, in this page, how many people have seen the film already? Oh, great. That's great. That's great. I'll take you as a proxy for the whole group. And um, so just to, just to fill you in that my grandfather, uh, his father came here in 1854 on a ship with $20 in his pocket. He arrived in Baltimore not in Ellis Island. Can you imagine somebody who didn't come to New York? So he came to Baltimore, as many did with $20 in his pocket. Um, and he became a peddler, uh, as many, many Jews did, and many others did on the Winchester Trail and other trails there. You just walked. And he said he had to walk with a pack. You'd go to a store and you'd get goods. They would give you goods on spec. And when you sold the goods, you'd give them the money back, whatever you owed them. So, um, he, he did that. And he said the greatest day in his life was when he got a, a horse because then he didn't have to carry the pack anymore. That's <laughs> so think about that when you think about the greatest day in your life. So um, that was Samuel. Samuel came here. And uh, interestingly, he actually connected with uh, a German family. He's for, he was from Germany, from uh, Rhine-Westphalen, which uh, I have been to the area, but not into anything that resembles his house. And he, um, he met uh, the daughter of the store owners, Hammerslaw. Their, I mean, their sister, not their daughter, their sister had come. And he fancied her and she fancied him. And so they were married in 1957. And uh, I think that's very romantic. Uh, $20 in your pocket. And suddenly the in-laws for a wedding present, gave him a store to manage in Peoria. 1957 or 1857? 18. Did I say 19? 19. Don't count on me. Thanks. <laughs> but I uh, thank you. But uh, 1857. And so uh, they went to Peoria and then they went to a place in the South, but they didn't like the segregation at all. So they left there and they, they, they developed a very nice business. My grandfather was born. He had, there were actually uh, six of them, but one died and uh, they were happy family. Um, and his father had stores and worked with the Hammerslaws all, and then finally went independent. Uh, but uh, at age 16, my grandfather left high school. I don't think that was uncommon. And he went to visit his w more wealthy family in um, uh, his family's family, his father's family in uh, New York. And they had a clothing business and he worked there. And then he lived with his cousin and he went off his, on his own and started their own business, which was a massive failure. You'll be glad to know. And uh, meanwhile, he just per persevered in the, in the clothing business and ended up in Chicago. He had been born, by the way, his, uh, just to make it clear, my grandfather was born in Springfield where his father, my great grandfather had built a store. Caddy Corner, actually, uh, they, their house was Caddy Corner from Lincoln. And I think that made a big impression on my grandfather. Well, uh, it, it's, it's really extraordinary because he was good. He was a good businessman, obviously. Richard Sears, I don't know how many of you know, if you haven't seen the movie, you'll, you won't know, but Richard Sears was a terrific promoter. He was a great salesman. You know, if shook his hand, you better count your fingers. And uh, he used to say, well, you can buy, he had a catalog where you'd say, uh, 
you could buy furniture, but it was dollhouse furniture, that kind of thing. And um, so uh, he had um, one day into his store came my, uh, my grandfather's brother-in-law. Uh, meanwhile, my grandfather had married, sorry. And he, he, the brother-in-law came into Richard Sears' store and said, can I sell you some pneumatic tubes? And Richard Sears said, wait, wait, I have all these pants. I've got orders for so many pants. Remember this was, that was, this is happening um, in um, 1863, about then. So, so this was after the civil war and things were doing pretty well. And there was a lot of people coming out of um, military that needed clothing. And, and he said, I, I, need, I need to, um, find out where I can uh, uh, have these manufactured. This was the kind of person Richard Sears was. He really uh, was a brilliant salesman. Uh, meanwhile, at one point, Roebuck, who was basically, um, I think a watch repairman and a partner of Richard Sears wanted to retire. And Richard Sears went looking for capital to grow his business and also to replace Roebuck and pay him out. Well, he owed my grandfather a lot of money, <laughs> but what happened was Nussbaum found out about it. My, the brother-in-law found out about this. And he said, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll buy half your, you know, I'll buy half your business. Then he went to the family and asked, would you like to come in? And the only one who'd like to is my grandfather. Was that a coincidence? Not entirely because Richard Sears owed him a ton of money having manufactured things for him like pants. So this, is, this was easy for him. He came in, so the three of them worked together. The brother-in-law, Aaron Nussbaum, my grandfather, Julius Rosenwald, and Richard Sears. Aaron Nussbaum was a very straight-laced person, very proper. Richard Sears, not so much. He liked to go out for lunch, have a nice time, come back a little inebriated. Well, Aaron Nussbaum decided that Richard Sears had to walk through his office in order to get to, to Richard Sears' office because he wanted to check on him and <clears throat> Sears just didn't like it. And he finally went to the brothers and said, brother-in-laws and said, look, one of us has to buy the other, two of us have to buy the one of us out. We can't do it three. So I'll go with whoever likes, but somebody's got to buy somebody. And it was decided uh, that, um, Aaron Nussbaum should be bought out. That created bad blood in the family for generations. And it was a great tragedy in a way, uh, because that sounds like a perfectly fair business deal. 1865, buy half the business together with your brother-in-law, everything is fine. So he wasn't in the business. Well, it happened that this was the beginning of one of those incredible boom periods and just American business grew and grew and grew. And in 1910, Sears was one of the first stores to go public. My grandfather, who was born in a nice middle-class family and didn't expect much, suddenly was rich, rich beyond his wildest dreams, 1910. My father was then seven years old, was very much affected. He was the youngest in the family. And he was very much affected by the amount in which my grandfather and his wife were suddenly, and his my father's mother, was suddenly swept up in a swirl of social, business, and philanthropic activities. It was really very sad. He thought, my father thought that the Children's Hour, have you ever heard of the poem, The Children's Hour? I think it's by Robert Louis Stevenson. And he thought that was the one hour a day you get to see your mother. <laughs> That's so sad. And he was jealous of the chauffeur's children because they got to be with their mother in the kitchen, in the family's, their family's kitchen. So it was a difficult childhood for him, but he um, luckily had a sister and they were like twins and they had, they had one thing they shared very much. They hated their governess, Miss Nickerson. Every year, the family would go to Germany every year and uh, to visit the relatives. Now, this is the head of Sears, an incredibly booming catalog and then eventually stores, a few stores. And uh, he would leave for two months in the summer without without iPhones, <laughs> without phone, without much phones, you know, and without much, there were telegrams, but and he'd take a boat. Now I can't even imagine this, but he did that. He had, he knew how to have people whom he could count on. And the reason I'm saying this is because 
he was a business genius. He he understood how you take orders from all different parts, put them together, figure out if you don't have green pajamas, should you substitute it blue, what size and so forth. And he had a money back guarantee, which he had borrowed from um, Marshall Fields. Uh, but he, he, uh, he really cared about his family in Germany and spent a lot of time with them. Uh, my father spoke fluent German and um, he spent the summers with his cousins. So as a matter of fact, one day my father said to his, his father, um, I, really want to, I, I really want you to come and see this museum. And it was the museum of what was a museum of industry. Uh, and in, I think it was in Munich, is that right, Aviva? And um, where they were. And um, Deutsche Museum. And my, my grandfather, who was then, as I say, very, very wealthy uh, and liquid because of the, of the um, going public, uh, decided Chicago needed a place like that and developed the Museum of Science and Industry. When my grandfather came back, from Germany, he was appalled to find out that they had named it after him and he made them take the name off. He did not like having anything named after him. Um, this does not answer your question about Black Lives Matter, but I think that to give you an idea of how hands-on he was, he was a very practical, pragmatic man. You didn't get philosophy, his philosophy in the movie, you heard him say, uh, why do people believe that because you're rich, you must be very smart when there's so much evidence to the contrary? So that was the kind of person my grandfather was. He had no pretensions, none. I love that quality. Uh, and so he was perfectly happy to have somebody black or anybody else. He, he wasn't at all racist, but I don't know how he would have felt because after all, you're asking the question about a different time. Mm -hmm. uh, but when he read two books that were very influential to him, that friend of his had sent him, uh, one of them was up from slavery. Uh, he had the chance to meet Booker T. Washington and was totally inspired by him. So I don't know what that says to you. So, so let me ask. Let me ask. Most you. most rewarded by that activity. His obviously, and we see it in the film. His philanthropic work, work is amazing and so important and so moving, so ahead of its time. And um, and did that carry over into his work life at all? Um, was there was there any it was did his work for social justice was that huh. was that in any way reflected in in Sears and in his uh, first of all he got that mostly I, I think one of the big influences on him besides his family upbringing and being Jewish and he was always charitable um, he gave when he said uh, that he had the biggest gift he ever gave was fifteen thousand uh, excuse me he gave a gift of $5,000, I think it was. And that was the biggest gift he ever gave, even though he gave away millions, because at that time he didn't know how he was going to pay it. Mm. He felt that was the biggest gift he gave. And that was before he became wealthy or, or, or anything. So um, he was very influenced by Rabbi Emil Hirsch at Sinai Synagogue in Chicago, who was a real social, social justice um, uh, proponent. And, and he would have, I think, embraced, I think, or Hirsch would have definitely embraced Black Lives Matter. And, uh, but that's a hypothetical. Um, in Chicago, you had the influx of people coming from the South with lynchings and everything going on. And they, the housing was appalling. So my grandfather built housing for them in Chicago. So I suppose he understood it. But I can't tell you, he wasn't a dogmatist. I've never, the fact is that Sears had one of the first profit sharing plans uh, I've heard that attributed to his wife, Augusta Nussbaum, who suggested it because she was a very good person. She wasn't necessarily the most maternal mother at that point. She had been better with her older three children than the two babies because she had had more time. But she wanted to do what was right. And she, I think, encouraged the plan. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Fabulously. Um, Aviva, let me bring you back into this and, um, and ask you, um, First of all, I want to ask you a cinematic question here, if I can. This is a very different direction. And uh, I, I know there's a lot of deep questions waiting in the chat room, but I wanted to know that if the, um, I, I noticed you used a lot of old films and a lot of new films and a lot of film footage um, to tell the story as kind of, instead of just using like stock footage from certain periods, you used, um, what did I see there? I saw there, the Frisco Kid and an old Eastwood film 
Um, even Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, which uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you're a fan. Um, and uh, um, I remember watching that growing up. Um, what was that? Tell me a little bit about that choice. Well, I believe uh, my theory is that I make documentaries that I feel that flow like feature films. And oftentimes feature films really give you the sense. Like when we had Samuel being a peddler, um, for, uh, Frisco Kid just made a lot of sense. And actually the wedding scene it, of Samuel and his wife is from Frisco Kid. And I've had people come out of the movies and say to me, how did you get footage of that? Where of course there wasn't even movies back then. <laughs> so then I know I succeeded. When we talk about how crowded um, a, an apartment building was, I remembered Raise It in the Sun and that scene when Sidney Poitier runs into the bathroom. But what was really significant to me for using that footage was in fact, um, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, who died way too young from cancer, had grown up in Chicago and her father had championed uh, uh, integration and fought against segregation. Now, when it came to Dr. Quinn, yes, I am a big Dr. Quinn fan. Uh, and I remember there was a scene of a Jewish peddler coming in and it was like a great day in the editing room because um, he comes and he, he sells to the foreigners. I mean, people, you know, the whites, the uh, African-Americans and the Indians. And that's just how the lines were delivered. I mean, you can't get any better than that. And of course, to show Birth of the Nation, the you know, insidious racist film, when you're talking about uh, you know, what was happening, because in fact, J.R. fought in Chicago to prevent Birth of the Nation from being shown there. So I was uh, very happy with that. But to me, the biggest coup is, my father was a Yiddish, spoke a fluent Yiddish, and it comes to um, scenes about peddlers, well, I'm thinking, okay, uh, what films can I find? And it's usually like TV films. And sure enough, I found that one little scene with Clint Eastwood, you know, speaking Yiddish with the other guy, with the peddler. And I thought, oh my God, oh, if my father was only alive and to see that. Uh, and, and Eastwood was very nice when, you know, we asked permission, that, that was really great. But what's fascinating is sometimes the feature footage because Henry Hampton, who was a very important civil rights lawyer and headed Howard Law School here, had worked uh, on the, uh, the integration cases, you know, board versus, Brown versus the board. And he, in fact, had taken some of that footage. So we have a civil rights lawyer with some of the footage, you know, of kids playing and stuff like that. So you just have to try to go everywhere you can to, to be able to, uh, I think, successfully show, um, you know, the times. I, 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 for some reason today, I want to tell the story about Springfield. So we knew that um, J.R. had been born in a house across the street. And I went with uh, Elizabeth's cousin, Peter Askeley, who wrote this wonderful book on uh, uh, JR and I really recommend getting it to Springfield and I had called the park service ahead and said you know I want to see the house this family lived in the Rosenwald family and I understand it's across the street so they oh right so they said well let's look up uh, let's look it up we arrive it turns out the park service was using that house for their offices and not until we came in that day did they realize it and right now it's been, there's a designated marking. So I feel like as, a, as an investigative documentary filmmaker, we were able to identify that. And then just one thing on the whole um, Sears, there's one line in the film, it goes very fast, but it is true that I think um, Sears was the Amazon of its time. You know, and what the story I love the most is how they made the Sears catalog smaller than Montgomery Ward. So be on top of it. And so that people would um, go to that first. Very, very clever uh, businessmen. Um, <clears throat> but I think I want to make sure Elizabeth talks tonight because it's something very dear to my heart as a child of a Holocaust survivor is all those trips of taking his kids to Germany really paid off in a rescue way 
because uh, J.R. died in 32, but his kids, including Elizabeth's father, saved 300 members of their family, brought them here, got them jobs, housing. And the only other story I know of that is Carl Lemley, who was a Hollywood producer. And I think it's very much the whole, you know, Rosenwald way of rescuing. I don't know if Elizabeth wants to talk about it more, but I just want to make sure it's mentioned. And we did, we did show the Lemley film, and I think there are comparisons, you're right. Um, I just have to say that, that, that uh, I met some of these people at a reunion. Uh, I think that Viva had organized uh, people seeing her film, and a man stood up and talked about how his mother had been one of the people rescued and how insane she went, because my father, who was sort of organizing all of this, all, all five siblings worked, you know, contributed to getting affidavits. It was a very hard job to get these people over. You would think with Sears, it would be easy, but it was shocking how difficult it was. And um, I mean, it would have been shocking. How, of course, we're all shocked by how difficult it was. And so um, uh, he's described how his mother would go insane for about three weeks before my father would come to visit, which he felt it was his obligation to do. And and she would try to clean up. It's like he didn't, he wouldn't have even noticed. <laughs> If it hadn't been neat, but she was so insane because he he was coming to see her. In fact, my mother was a refugee, and people said my father loved refugees so much. I mean, this was the, the legacy. Not only these people, a family, uh, but he really threw himself in because he knew about the German relatives and what they were going through, and he understood because he understood what was going on in Germany since he had seen Germany year after year. He knew what this meant, and um, he. He threw himself into it. Well, people said he loved Jews so much he even married a Jew, and that was my mother. I mean, he loved he loved refugees so much he even married a refugee. That was my mother, and she was um, from a refugee from Russia and from Germany. She called herself a refugee. Jew. Yeah, and let me say that of all my films, there's always so many elements I can't put in the film, but this was even more. I have, if you buy the DVD of Rosenwald, there are four and a half hours of bonus features, which include the story of the rescue, uh, some of the artisans, more on Augusta Savage, on Gordon Parks. I mean, it's amazing how he, what he was able to do with his Rosenwald. Um, also on Rabbi Hirsch, who I just adore. He is my inspiration and the kind, uh, he was one of the founding um, members of the NAACP. And I think absolutely, he would have been supportive of Black Lives Matter. And it's just there, and there's also a downloadable study guide on our website. And hopefully very soon I'll pay off the rights I still owe and I'll be making a streaming deal for the film for next year. Fantastic. You know, um, it bothers me a little bit uh, that we can talk a lot more about the rescue of the German relatives and the family's uh, tradition of, of, of being concerned about refugees. Does anybody know what the joint is, the JDC? Uh, that does rescue and, and everything. And my grandfather was involved, my father and I am too. Um, but uh, we can talk about that. But I think that what, what bothered me about the whole thing is the Rosenwald schools or the Rosenwald effort. This was really Booker T. Washington. Right. It was his inspiration. It was his idea. And I don't know this is, I mean, part of what you're talking about since you asked about blacks, this is part of the implicit racism that continues is maybe they should be called the Booker T. Washington schools. You know, I really think that money is such a driver in America, but here was this man who understood that black children were getting no education and, wow. knew, and knew how to get it. <laughs> so, it's, a, it's a brave statement. I mean, I think, I think it's really knowing, knowing like, you know, that this doesn't, that this, these things don't happen alone. Um, oh no, but they, they really the idea of it is so much more precious than the money in a way. Yeah, yeah. I have so many more questions, but there have been like a million questions in the chat. So I'm gonna hand things over to our program manager, Morgan Maggot, who is going to bring people on to ask their questions live. Thank you folks for asking these amazing questions and way too many, so over to you. Hi everyone. Um, I'm sure I've emailed many of you in the past, so it's nice to actually uh, see you face to face now. Um, so the first uh, question from the audience we're going to take is from Karen A. Karen, you are on. Thanks. Um, thanks to Elizabeth. Your your grandfather was amazing, and thanks to Aviva, the the film was just terrific. Yes, I, I did wonder whether 
um, Jr. was ever criticized or whether he ever felt any risk about giving his money to African Americans rather than to whites. Um, Somebody said, well, people didn't realize who he was and what he was doing. Oh, that's not no, um, that's a good question. Must have known businessmen and others, and his name was on all those schools, and he was right. a trustee. Right. So I just wondered whether he did feel a risk and whether he felt threatened or was threatened at any point. No, no, I, I think he wouldn't have noticed. He wasn't that type of person. There was a lot of controversy about things. At one point he supported a candidate and gave some money he shouldn't have, and that was a big brouhaha. And once Sears was criticized for paying people too little wages, the women too little wages, and that was a brouhaha. But the, no, I don't think he, he could have cared. I mean, I'm sure there was controversy because look, you didn't need um, Twitter and Facebook to have gossip, you know, and 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 people making uh, all kinds of statements. Anybody can say anything, but I don't think he would have cared at all. It just wouldn't have meant a thing to him. Uh, let me be clear: the emphasis in the movie is his his giving to African American communities. J.R. was very generous in the Jewish community. He was one of the founders of the Federation. He helped to save. Uh, Jews in Eastern Europe during the programs, um, and he he continued to help uh, settle uh, the newcomer the newcomer Jewish newcomers to Chicago. It's just this is what the emphasis on the film was because I really felt that was really the dramatic story and so unknown and included so many incredible figures both uh, in the arts and politicians. I mean, you know. <laughs> To be able to get a film with uh, Marian Anderson stories, John Lewis stories, Eugene, I, I mean, you know, I'm just blessed on the richness of what the story was about. I don't know who D. Dector is. I don't know who D. Dector is, but I see in the comments I'm not supposed to read, but if you tell me I'm not supposed to do something, that's exactly what I do. Unfortunately, I have very bad personality. And um, so uh, I see somebody who said, you know, they didn't have blacks in the Sears catalogs, and that is absolutely true. And he was a person of his time. I'm not making any apologies about it. Uh, I, I'm afraid to say that if you look at ads mostly, you don't see too many blacks nowadays when we're more conscious of it. But I'm ashamed that, you know, he. I wish he had been, you know, more visionary about that, but he, he did what he felt was beneficial as it was brought to him. He didn't bring ideas. He actually took, like Thomas Jefferson, who didn't have ideas, he improved on others ideas. Um, he, he not, not in the slavery thing, thank you. Um, he, he, really, he really was uh, brilliant at, at, at making a Booker T. Washington's, um, his, his ideas work beyond what Booker T. Washington could have thought. Booker T. Washington died, by the way, in 1915. So this carried on for years afterwards. My father gave a great deal of his money to a foundation. I, I don't know how inspired he was by the um, 1913 income tax. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but he gave a great deal of money to a foundation when he made a huge amount. And it was a sunset foundation. Do you know what that is? That means it has to go out. Well, in this case, it was 25 years. It has to all be spent down, which means he didn't believe that you just keep it and you eke it out 5% here, 2% there. You really make a difference in your time. And that's what he was able to do. And um, so that, that may or may not answer the question about, I, but there's nothing good to say about it's not having blacks, except that I don't see it nowadays so much. Mm -hmm. uh, let me you something else. Um, it was amazing to me that there was only one story which mm -hmm. um, is told in the film of a school being burnt down. And of course they built it again. But in terms of J.R. himself being in danger, you know, of course, the governor of Georgia had attacked him, but also you have to remember Leo Frank was at that time, and that was the lynching of uh, a Jewish man who was running up, uh, running uh, his uh, family's factory, and we have a bonus feature on that. So, um, and year, years later, this is after J.R. was gone, but people have said to me who have seen the film that Sears was one place people knew that they could get summer jobs if you were African-American. 
Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, I forgot to tell you. And the other thing is because of rural free delivery, at least, you know, um, and the way the catalog operated, at least blacks who couldn't, wouldn't be allowed, especially in the South in certain stores, at least could order from it. <laughs> so it made it a, a, you know, a better way to be able to order things. If you could I order love, them. Yeah. Um, you know I'd love um, for Zach K to ask this question now. I, I think Aviva, you'll have a lot to say about this. Oh, uh, hey, um, listen, two quick comments, then my question. One, I, I think I might be an Aviva Kemp Kempner uh, groupie or something. You know, I've seen all your movies, but seriously, I thought Hank Greenberg was the best movie I'd ever seen. And now you've kind of topped that. And uh, I'm obviously a couple of years behind. But what a magnificent thing. But a couple of things. One, that was my first comment. Second comment is, you know, maybe the Rabbi uh, Hirsch one could be your next topic. I mean, you know, I hope you'll consider it. But, but third, really, for both of you, uh, because, you know, I think you tell the story you find. I'd love it if I could ask you what maybe are some of the most surprising things you uncovered or discovered, both for you, Elizabeth, right, because it's actually a member of your family. Was there anything new you learned or uncovered or discovered? And obviously, the great documentarian, please, I'm so interested. Thank you. Aviva, you go. Well, you know, it, this happens with every film almost I do. Like I went in to do the Hank Greenberg story because of course, um, you know, I grew up in Detroit. My father always talked about Hank Greenberg. This is what we heard of on Cold Nidre. I thought Hank was part of that. So the day he died, I said, I'm gonna do a film on him. But I never knew the ending story, the Jackie Robinson story and um, that he greeted him. And of course I'm roaring for the Dodgers tonight. Um, and then when it came to Molly Goldberg, I never knew that there had been a horrible story about her, her stage husband, Philip Lowe, being blacklisted. Um, and then with Rosenwald, I thought I was going in because of the schools and then some of my favorite works of art or music. I mean, what they did, the whole Rosenwald fund, I had not known about that when I decided I was gonna make the film. Of course, I learned pretty quickly. So I think just all those wonderful stories of supporting artisans at such a young age and at a time where they really didn't have a chance is quite amazing. Um, Elizabeth, do you happen to, I mean, this is your whole family history, of course, but um, maybe when you were growing up, is there, is there a standout memory for you? Like when you learned something incredible? Well, I want to tell you an incredible thing that I heard. My grandfather was very worried about money, uh, not worried about money. Excuse me, he was very concerned with money and nobody in the family could understand it because they had plenty of money. Uh, but he would get very angry if you left the lights on and so forth. And my father would talk about this, my father not having any sense of of, of, of being care with money and uh, but not being sloppy about it. And he said that um, he wrote to his brother, how could you spend six cents on mandolin strings? This was a letter to, I mean, to his, to his son, his other son. My grandfather wrote to his son Lessing, how could you spend six cents on mandolin strings when Sears has them for two cents? And, and how could you do such a thing? But he wants um, his, his, uh, my father told the story about how his beloved sister Marion, who grew up with him almost as a twin, they even wore the same clothes, except my father was upset because he didn't get a bow in his hair. And um, uh, she wrote my grandfather when she was about 20 and she was away from home and she wrote him a telegram. Roses are red, violets are blue, send me a hundred PDQ. Do you know what that means? Does anybody remember? Pretty darn quick, right? And he wrote her back a telegram Roses are red, carnations pink. I'll send you the hundred, I don't think. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the kind of thing I, I remember growing up mostly. That's great. Um, one more question from our audience. Um, Nathan Nathana, you are up. Um, please feel free to correct me on the pronunciation of your name as well. It's Nathana. Um, Aviva, it was, it, it's an, an inspiring film. It's just beautifully done and it really, uh, give so much hope for us today in today's in today's world. On that note, I just wanted to ask Elizabeth if you think your father or your grandfather were political in any way and what they would think about our anti-Semitic and racist president. Yes, well, remember, um, 
at the time, my father was trying to help the German family get out of Germany. And he talked a lot about this. Um, he said it was a different time. People criticized, he said people criticized FDR so much for not being more helpful in getting the Jews out, if you remember. And, and, and they were so angry at him and discredited him. He said, you have to understand what the sentiment was in this country. I mean, nowadays we're shocked with America first. America first was a very well accepted feeling all across the country, not by everybody, certainly, but by an awful lot of people. And um, uh, my father, when he became the general chairman of UJA at one point, he was called up that morning before he accepted it. And somebody said, if you accept this job, you're a traitor to your country because you're loyal to Israel and you can't be a loyal to two countries. This is, this is 1955. I mean, it, it was a different time. So I think that he would have been, both of them would have been horrified and disgusted and tried to make a difference and stop it. But I might know that a lot of, not very much political activity. Um, there is now more political activity. And my, somebody asked about in the questions about what the family's done since. And my aunt Edith, did you see my aunt Edith in the, in the, um, in the film? Uh, she was the one who brought Marian Anderson around and introduced her and got her and, and didn't care if she was black or whatever. And then her son, her husband said, well, maybe our friends will object. And she said, well, we'll find out who our friends are. And she created a lot of foundations. Crossroads, I think was the name of it. And I think it still exists. I think it does. But she hired some very good people and all her children and grandchildren. And I think grand grandchildren were involved in social justice here in America, and particularly black justice and justice for the poor, which I say way to go. But my grandfather gave a lot of money to Jewish organizations, uh, including the joint. He gave $5 million to help um, people who were starving in Ukraine because Jews were not allowed to own land or you know, have very good jobs and uh, to help them get tractors and so forth. Uh, and he, he was very concerned uh, with many Jewish, well, he had enough money to give to different things. And I think that's something to remember. But he, uh, my father, uh, who dedicated his life, um, he always felt there was enough to do more than one thing. You can help blacks and Jews. It's not an either or, and people forget that. Um, next up, uh, Dee Dechter actually wanted to, I think, clarify yes. one of her, uh, their, sorry, uh, their, their points earlier. So we're going to let them Hi. clarify. I think you have to unmute. Yes. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, I was only responding about the black in the catalogs to someone who said, weren't the Sears buildings burnt down too? And I wanted to make a point that was in response to someone else in the chat. And I wanted to make a point that the general population did not connect Sears to Rosenwald. They didn't know that a Jew was in charge of Sears. Sears was where they shopped, where they bought things, et cetera. And they had no idea who JR was. He was not out there saying, hi, everybody, I'm Sears. Um, Aviva, I really liked the movie. It was very illuminating. And I wanted to know what your reception was and what this movie's reception is today, or when you made it, I think was 2015, in right. the Southern black communities, also the North and West. A lot of times they say, we shouldn't say, oh, the whites gave us this and did that and extol the whites. And, you know, they also are saying a lot of the black community, even now, Jews are no different from the whites. So we wouldn't, shouldn't be um, pro-Jews or pro-Israel or anything. I wanted to know from you, Aviva, what reaction the film has brought. Right. Well, several things. In 2015, what gave me a lot of satisfaction and joy was it was, uh, especially in Washington, D.C., but I traveled all over, very integrated audiences, wonderful, warm reception, because you have to understand a lot of people are descendants of the Rosenwald schools, and the, the minute they heard what the film was about, they were there bringing their, you know, just like people would bring three generations to Hank Greenberg, they would bring three generations to Rosenwald. And by the way, I need to mention Marion Sears Hunter's name, who edited both Hank Greenberg and uh, Rosenwald. So I think the reaction was really great. But what I'm finding now is a lot of people didn't see the film. And because we have an increased awareness about what the African-American experience is in America, 
that I'm just finding even more warmer, more um, interested interest in it. And all I can say is the example I'm using is the example I knew growing up and still know in terms of how Jews are very involved in the civil rights movement or cared about economics and you know culture. And I um, I haven't heard uh, any you know overtly negative response at all. Wait a minute, you didn't mention that the Times gave her just the most glowing review. It was such a rave, it was crazy. Yeah, I know, it was great. It was really, I mean, not that that's, you know. And I showed it at the White right. House. Unfortunately, uh, President Obama didn't come, but certainly Barry, uh, Barry Jarrett did, because, you know, of course her mother was in the film and that was great. Hmm. Um, I'm just gonna ask one more uh, question so that also so Aviva can go watch the Dodgers play. Uh, <laughs> Well, but, um, we, had, that end, hopefully. Um, we had a question from Millie Burns and she uh, wanted me to ask it actually, but um, I'd love for both of you to answer this. Um, what, what can we do? What do maybe all of us can do uh, to cultivate more people like JR? Um, maybe Aviva, I'd love to start with you since you've, you've studied so much history and so many people that have made such an right. impact on the world. Well, uh, three things. One is I'll never forget a young kid came out of the opening night and said, now I know what I want to do with my life. So I always say to people, <laughs> you know, not all of you can have $68 million to give away, but all of you can be JR in your own lives. And whenever I read in the paper about certain people, uh, you know, famous, great philanthropists, I try to send them the DVD. And I think that's what makes me the happiest because myself, a 501c3, the only way I've ever made any of my movies is charitable contributions. So, you know, I'm like one of those Rosenwald grant recipients. And I just think it's so important to give an example of how your gift, giving can have such results because almost all the artisans you know about, the schools made an incredible difference. I, I mean, you know, Anything he decided to invest in made a big difference. And I think people need to see examples of that. I also think that it's very hard um, when people see millions given to something, they say, well, my dollar doesn't mean anything, which is completely not true because there's millions of you out there. <laughs> but I, I think we are in a, in a barbell society. I think we're in a, bit, a society ever, ever more of rich and poor and it, it, very, very upsetting. But I've seen people who had very little money uh, do you remember the woman who was a, what was she, a house cleaner? And she left money for girls to go to college. She left quite a bit of money, 200000 or something, for girls to go to college. I mean, everybody can do something if they want to. And, and uh, don't be daunted by the fact that it's not a huge amount of money. Or you can reach out with your person. You can call somebody you know is lonely or is, is anxious or whatever you want to do. I think that uh, these are values that should be espoused. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, remember, JR didn't go to school, but I think school is a good place to have them. I think we spend a little too much time on trigonometry, as important as it is, and a little too little on what's the point of being alive. <laughs> and you know, it's Sadaka and it's Tukum alone. We should be very proud in the Jewish culture, but other religions have it too. And certainly it's a big thing in the African-American community. And we just have to keep on practicing it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to mention a new film I'm working on because I bet the same is true that what happened with Rosenwald. I want you all to, when you get off, to look up Ben Hecht, H-E-C-H-T. He was a great newspaper man, a great uh, screenwriter, some of the most famous movies. But when he found out that 2 million people, uh, G uh, European Jewry were already murdered in 41, he got very involved in doing everything he could to get them out of Europe and then later on to Palestine. And luckily this wonderful man, William Levine, who, who supported my film on Mo Berg, came to me and said, you've got to make this film. And I just feel it's sort of my life's mission to tell these underknown stories of Jewish heroes, but also to be able to inspire the whole population. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we'll keep showing them in the future and we'll definitely look forward to that. Um, yeah. Aviva and Elizabeth, thank you so much for taking the time out of your Tuesday uh, to tell us more about this film and about both of about your stories. Um, it was kind of again. neat. Excuse me. It was a kind of neat audience, I have to say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we, miss our, uh, we miss our crew. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> and um, go to rosenwaldfilm.org or Chesla Foundation, and you can order the DVD and more four and a half more hours of wonderful stories. Maybe the um, JCC could post the link to the yeah. um, film. Yes. To purchase we'll, it. Uh, we'll share everything on Facebook and uh, with the community. Um, again, thank you to all of our partners. Um, the the Chesla Foundation, I believe. Yes, yeah, yeah. so C I E S L A. C um, C the cat I E L A. Uh, the Kellogg Foundation, the National yeah. Center for Jewish Film, um, all of our partners uh, within the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan ecosystem. Um, folks, thank you again for taking the time to spend with us tonight. Um, please make sure to vote um, and uh, join us again on Monday for our Films for Democracy panel uh, and a lot more coming up uh, later this winter and fall. So we will wear, your, we will. wear a mask. And yes, please wear a mask, stay six feet apart, uh, be safe, and hopefully see you all next week. Thank you.